and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. Today's show is a very special episode. It's a live episode which took place in a newly opened vinyl record store in Stamford in England in March this year. My guest is the legendary music man Ted Carroll, former manager of the 70s rock band Thin Lizzy, founder of Chiswick Records and owner of the original London-based Rock On Records, of which this store continues its name. In this episode, Ted takes us on a journey through his incredible 60-year music career, from his early days discovering jazz and rock and roll, to managing the talented band Skid Row with Gary Moore. Ted's experiences in the music industry are nothing short of fascinating. And while you're listening to the episode, take in time to enjoy the sound of this thriving English Georgian market town. You can hear church bells, customers coming in the shop. I think it adds to the atmosphere. And if you like vinyl records, consider making a visit to the shop, which lies conveniently minutes from the A1, just halfway between London and York. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. Today I'm in the Georgian market town of Stamford which is about 100 miles north, just over 100 miles north of London. It's a beautiful sunny day at the end of March. And I'm in a record store. Now, this is a bit like a time warp because I'm in a a vinyl record shop, which has only been going for a couple of weeks. Um, And I'm very pleased to introduce my guest today, Mr. Ted Carroll. Hello, Ted. Good afternoon. It's great to have you on. Thank you ever so much for coming on. Thank you. So how long have you had the store, Ted? This, this store, this particular one, opened. Uh, l- it's been open less than two weeks, but I first started selling records by mail order in 1969, so work that all out. That's 54 years ago. Wow. Yeah. But uh, the first rock on was a stall in the back of a flea market on Goldbourne Road. That's off Portobello, and it was open two days a week, Friday and Saturday, and that opened around the end of August 1971. Now, um, being a Thin Lizzy fan, and I don't know that you are, Ted, because you were the manager of Thin Lizzy, um, is it true what they say in the rocker, the, the lyrics, Rock On Store? Was yes. that inspired by Rock On Records by Phil Liner? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, Phil just wrote that. Phil used to, on a Friday, he'd sometimes, if they, if, well, if they weren't gigging uh, 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 on a Friday, he'd sometimes come down Portobello Road and he'd pop in the store and he just uh, wrote that uh, song it was a great great song we we hoped we'd get a hit it came out as a single we hoped we'd get a hit with it it was about a year after whiskey in the jar and um, I didn't really notice the lyrics too much but of course it, it's it's turned out it's it's a fantastic sort of tribute to to rock on you know yeah, yeah. anyway we'll, we'll talk about thin Lizzie and, and the record store a bit later on but first of, first of all Ted um, you've been in the music business a long time, mm-hmm. your sort of legendary status within the, the music industry. What made you, or how did you get into music? Um, well, just listening to the radio. I mean, in the early 50s, uh, I, I, I picked, I, I, well, pop records, but they weren't very exciting. I was into jazz, actually, when I was about, from about around the age of 11 or 12. And um, that's around the time rock and roll was just starting to come through. You know, Bill. Ha- I mean, I went to see Bill Haley and the Comets when I was 14 on their first world tour. You know, and that was just beyond exciting. And where, where was this, Ted? Where did you uh, the Theatre Royal in Dublin. They did four shows there. It was a three and a half thousand seater, so they played to 14,000 people in two days. They were big. Yeah. Very, very big. People think, people think Bill Haley is old hat, but the, play those records, they still sound great today and they're great to dance to. So that sounds like a really exciting time. So you actually, your, your sort of formative years were in, in the early rock and roll. Yeah, and, but I was into jazz and, and of course, I loved uh, Lonnie Donegan and, 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 and Skiffle and stuff. And that was, I, I got a guitar. I think I swapped it, I swapped a guitar, uh, um, um, I was into aeromodelling, oh, yeah. and I swapped a, um, a model aircraft engine uh, for a guitar and learned a few chords and uh, played in a couple of skiffle groups and then eventually a rock and roll band, and we were quite successful. And uh, But I was in the bank. At the, when I left school, I, I, I was in the Ulster Bank, which is a subsidiary of the Nat West. I did that for four years before I... The penny dropped. I decided I didn't really want to be a banker, 
And so um, I, I, I was got in. I was also involved in the motor trade. I worked for uh, selling motorbikes and, and, and cars around a panel beating business, you know, respraying cars and things like that. And also, I had a Volkswagen minibus. I used to drive bands. And uh, uh, prior to that, of course, I was in a band called the Caravels, and they became quite successful. They were a really good rock and roll band in, in Ireland. And um, that was 1960 and 61. And then they evolved into uh, the Green Beats and became the top Irish group. They had their own TV show yeah. and, and radio show, and they were very successful. They were a fantastic band. But I, I, I had to quit playing in them because I was in the bank. I managed them for a while, but then I slid out of that as well. They got, I got the bank found out, and I got transferred to the wilds of the country up near the, the border with uh, Northern Ireland. And, and from there, is that when you started coming? You came into England no, after that. Uh, I was, I was managing, I was booking, I was managing a band called Skid Row. Uh, in 68 and uh, I was also acting as an agent for a few ba northern bands The Method and The Few and The Grass Band and that and um, I was just starting to uh, help uh, organise gigs for some English bands we did three gigs or four gigs I forget with John Mell's Blues Breakers and we did a couple of gigs with The Nice and I went to England for a few months in the summer of 68 uh, to kind of catch new and up and coming bands and, and, and book them uh, for dates in Irish clubs. And I ended up staying in England. And I've been here since. And, and the, uh, the Skid Row that you mentioned, was that the famous Skid Row with Gary Moore? That's right, yeah. Well, Gary wasn't in it when I managed them. I managed them when they, I helped them start and managed them for the first four or five months and then uh, Gary came along while I was in England but then I came back and worked with them uh, for as a tour manager for about six or seven months in in 1970 I, I took the gig because um, uh, they were going to America and it was a chance to get to America in 1970 was something very special wow. yeah a fantastic time in music generally yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we, America was fantastic because we played with amazing bands in America. We played with Muzz of Invention, uh, with the Allman Brothers Band, the Stooges, uh, all sorts of amazing bands. Mountain, you know, it was a great tour. Yeah. Yeah. And at what point did the, the Thin Lizzy bit start up? Well, uh, a friend of mine, Brian Chute, was managing Thin Lizzy and... Uh, I, I was I came home to our, to Dublin where I'm from uh, with Skid Row because they were doing a, an Irish tour and they, that was the Christmas of 1970 going into 71 and uh, uh, I was I, I was I'd already said I was leaving I, I said I'm leaving but I, I'll, I'll hang on until you get sorted out with another tour manager and. Uh, so I ended up staying till the end of February. But uh, I went to dinner with Brian and, and, uh, on the New Year's Eve, and he had a test pressing of the first Thin Lizzy album and played it to me. And of course, I knew Phil because from 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 Skid Row. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and uh, but I, I didn't know Eric Bell. He was new to me, but he was a fantastic guitarist. So I, I heard the test pressing, and I was very impressed with the songs and the lyrics and things. So I said, OK, I'll get involved. And uh, so I brought them to England in April 1971 and looked after them for the first three or four years until I finished in uh, Focus on Rock On and also to start the record label. And that was in August 1974. Ted, you were obviously involved in the, um, the first hit of Thin Lizzy, Whiskey in the Jar. Yeah. Um, how did that come about, that song? Um, well, uh, before Thin Lizzy uh, were formed, uh, and after Phil left Skid Row, he did a bit of gigging in, in, in folk pubs in, uh, around Dublin. Uh, singing kind of mostly his own songs but also some ballads so and songs like Whiskey in the Jar they just everybody knows them because they're around all the time and um, they started doing that 
uh, song in their set about six months before they recorded it. And um, they just, it was just kind of, do, you know, being a three piece, you've got to try and do as many different things as you can. So they just suddenly thought, we'll try this. And um, so fi- instead of playing bass, Phil played a rhythm guitar, you know, and changed over. And so it just broke up the set and it went down reasonably well. And uh, having played it for six months, Eric had worked out all the guitar parts and things. So they were going to make a set. We were trying to get out of the Decca deal, to be honest. We'd, we'd recorded two albums for Decca and um, we weren't very happy with Decca. They, we didn't feel they were putting enough welly into promoting the band and we wanted to get out, get somewhere else. Uh, and they said, OK, we'll just do one single and, and, and if that doesn't work, then you can get out of your contract a year ahead of, a year ahead of the time. So that's what it was. So the, Phil wrote a song called Black Boys on the Corner, which was kind of a melodic, heavy metal sort of thing, a deep, ter- deep purple type of thing. And uh, that was going to be the A-side. And, and uh, Phil said, I went up to rehearsal one day, and Phil said, I thought we could use do this on the B-side, you know, rather than throw away one of his own songs. And uh, I played it, and uh, this was about a week before they went in the studio, and he said, what do you think? And I said, I think if you can go in the studio and play it just like you played it now, it, you could have a hit. It's just fun. It's... it's you know, the whole thing, you know, the guitar parts, the guitar intro, everything. And that's what happened. All right, so you were quite influential in... Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No doubt about that. So what did, it, what did it feel like after all the touring and slugging around in different venues, all of a sudden to have a, a major hit? Um, well, it, it meant, A, we were drawing more punters because... The band had been playing around England for all, for two years, and played at every little club and uh, everywhere. And what you get when a band becomes popular, so all the people who went to see them in the past, oh, I went to see them when they were unknown, you know, and they come back. So you start drawing more punters, and of course new people come, and the money goes up. And um, we had a we had a, a, a pretty good PA because just before. Whiskey, we had done a tour with Slade, uh, a, an English tour with Slade and Susie Quattro, and um, Slade were using this new PA, which had been built for them by Charlie Watkins from Wem Amplification, and he'd always, a lot of people used his PAs, but they were columns, you know, 100 watt columns linked together, you maybe use... 10 or 20 of those, you know, for a 1,000 or 2,000 watt PA systems. He, for the first time, he'd built a PA with bins and tweeters and mid-range horns and everything. So uh, he'd given it to Slade to try out on this tour. So Chaz Chandler said, we, we got on the tour, we didn't have to have a buy. Normally, you'd have a buy-on where you'd pay a couple of grand or something uh, to support a big name like that because you'd be playing to full houses and they didn't George Seymour, they said you've got to have your own PA you can't use this because it's, it's brand new and we, 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 we can't risk it going wrong so we managed to buy a PA a 1200 watt PA but it was a really good one and, uh, and then we just about two weeks before the tour we got a call from Mickey Moses' office saying, can Susie Quattro use your PA? So we charged her, I think it was 200 quid a week or something, which was a bargain, but that more or less paid a lot of the, a lot of the, I mean, I think we paid 1,200 or 1,400 for the PA, so it paid uh, for a lot of the PA, that was was good. So when we started, when we had the hit with whiskey and we're going into clubs, bigger clubs and, and more punters, we had a PA that, was able to handle that, you know, because before that we were probably working with a little 400 watt couple of small columns, you know. Yeah. 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 Must have been a very exciting time. I mean, as a Thin Lizzy fan myself, yeah. um, and, and for any listeners out there who are Thin Lizzy fans, I think 
from my point of view, I think there were three phases of Thin Lizzy. It was the early part that you were involved in, Ted. Then there was the, the sort of classic four-piece, and then the introduction of keyboards later on. Sorry. Classic three-piece. Yes. Yeah. Classic yeah. three-piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the um, the sort of the final part of Thin Lizzy going up to about eighty-three with John Sykes and and the Daryl Wharton on keyboards and everything. Yeah, but that, well, that that goes long past my my time. Yeah. But I, I I was there for the. You know, Gary left. Gary joined the band in uh, January when Eric left. Yeah. Je- Eric left, I think, in 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 uh, I think it was New Year's Eve '73, and so we got Gary over, and he did the rest of the Irish tour, which was through January '74, and then we asked him to join, and he joined the band. And then he came to me about three months later and said, look, I think it'd be better if I left. I mean, I, I love being in the band and everything, but I want to get my own band together and you, you're looking for a new record deal. By this time, we were out of the Decca deal and we were uh, various record companies were coming to see the band and Gary said, you know, it, it, I'm going to have to sign a deal and I don't want to do that, so I think it'd be better if I left now. So... That was obviously made sense, although it kind of banjoed things for us. So Gary left, and then we started um, rehearsing and, and auditioning players. And we ended up with um, a couple of guitarists, John Cann from Atomic Rooster, and uh, the, lead, the lead guitarist was, oh, I can't remember his name, he was from a band called Ellis, which was a band that... Steve Ellis, the singer from Love Affair, put together. He was a German guy, a very good guitarist. He played electric guitar, lead guitar, but he used, his fingers didn't use a pick. And um, we actually did a German tour with them. We thought, it's kind of, looks like it might work. So we thought we'd go on the road and just see how it worked out. We did a German tour. And uh, we needed the money from the German tour anyway to pay for the rehearsals and things. And that, that didn't work out. It was okay, but it didn't work out. They didn't like it. In fact, Brian Downey left. He said, this is shit, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> they were supposed to do the last day coming back from Germany. It was a, a festival in Holland, and they, they, they didn't do it because Brian had enough. So I managed to talk Brian into staying. <laughs> and we carried on rehearsals, and then Scott and, and, and Brian... Turned up. Brian was a friend of Big Charlie, one of our roadies who was from Scotland. And uh, Scott uh, was his, his, was a cousin of Bob Seidenberg, who was in um, the Super Tramp. Super Tramp. Yeah. That's right. And uh, Roger, who, who who I who was a friend of mine and who came to work for me at Rock On and then became a partner in, in Ace, uh, mentioned to. He'd met, he met Scott through Bob Seidenberg and uh, I told him that Thin Lizzy were looking for guitarists, so he went for an audition and the rest is history. Still there. It, mu- it must have been fantastic seeing Thin Lizzy develop, you know, from 71 through to the Slade tour and then, you know, right through all that. And what was it like seeing them develop over that period of time? Did they change much? Yeah, they did. I mean, they were, when they came over, first of all, uh, they were... You know, playing small clubs, they were very introverted. Phil was still really coming to grips with playing the bass. I mean, he was always a good singer, but um, so he listened to everybody, you know, Frank Sinatra, any, any, anyone you can think of. He was very... Stevie Wonder was a favourite of his. But um, when they were playing then, he, 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 he found it difficult to project. Uh, 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 and But... You know, because they, they were good musically, it worked. But uh, gradually, he, he, he became, they became more confident, better. But uh, on the, I remember on the Slade tour, the first date was uh, City Hall in Newcastle, and myself and Chris Morrison, who by that time had replaced Brian Chute as as the manager. Uh, we went up to Newcastle for the f- opening night. And we were looking at the set list, and they were going to, I think it was they were going to open a second number on the set, was a song called Slow Blues. <laughs> that, 
And we said, oh, please don't play that. That's, you know, like you want to get out there and hit them with a bang. And um, no, they had to have slow blues. And um, afterwards, um, Chas Chandler came into the dressing room and said, look, you've got to get your finger out. If you don't, if you don't get, you know, get your finger out. So Chas Chandler was the you're, man you're, you're, uh, you're you're off the tour. Yeah, 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 you're yeah. off the tour. Yeah. So that shook them up. And Phil used to watch Slade every night from the side of the stage and show how naughty and, you know, how they worked, you know, and he learned a lot on that tour, and yeah. plus he had to up his game. So yeah. they impre- improved immensely as a, as a, a stage act just on that 20-odd dates, you know. Yeah. yeah. Very important it was. Yeah, sounds it. So at what point did you decide to form Rock On Records and, and sort of leave Thin Lizzy? Well, I, I started. I, I wasn't making any money out of Thin Lizzy. Thin Lizzy weren't making any money out of Thin Lizzy. They were barely scraping by, and uh, we we had to go back because we were doing gigs for like ten, tenor and five or even occasionally support gigs, tenor and you know. I remember we did a gig up n- near here in uh, in around May. A couple of months after they came over, it was in a big marquee supporting the flirtations, that girl group, and they play, played in this huge marquee. And Phil said, uh, <laughs> "said Jesus, we came away from Ireland to get away from these fucking marquees. They hated marquees because <laughs> there was no sa- the sound just disappeared out there. Yeah. Anyway." Uh, they, they, you know, they went back to Ireland for a quick tour in August 1971, about 10 dates, because they could get good money, relatively good money, say 100 to 100 to 200 quid a night there. So 10 days, you, we, we kind of filled up the, the, the empty coffers. And while we were over there, I discovered that... Um, there was a company called uh, Solomon and Pears, and they were record distributors, and they distributed Decca's record label. And so that's how I knew them through De- through Thin Lizzy, because yeah. Danny Hughes was a friend of mine, who was a promotion guy. Anyway, I discovered just by sheer chance that they had a room upstairs. They had a small, a very small place. They worked out of a muse place, but... There was a room upstairs, and uh, it was full of old London 45s. So I, I did a deal, and they allowed me to cherry-pick my way through there, and I bought about almost 2,000 45s for three and a half pence each. Wow. And uh, I went back. Uh, the shop opened. Rock On opened. The first day, I was in Ireland, but uh, two friends of mine two girls I knew took, look, looked after it and then the following Saturday I was back from Ireland with all these incredible London 45s and people were queuing up I mean I, I'd go down to the stall every Saturday morning and there'd be a queue of 10 or 12 people waiting for it to open and, and for any listeners that want to know a little bit about London Records what, what type of music was it Ted? Everything it was it, everything from Ray Charles, Little Richard, Fats Domino, Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran, the Ronettes, the Crystals, Love. Uh, you know, they even you know they even had sort of like contemporary stuff yeah. in, in the in the sixties. <laughs> ZZ Top, people like that. So it was a fantastic label. It was heavily. I mean, there's a London section over there. Most of the London collectors are dead now, but they're still an interest because they were wonderful pressings and fantastic. I mean, I collected London myself for a long time. Yeah. I must have had nearly a thousand London 45s. So back in 1971, that was gold dust. You know, I, I, was, I had records like, I mean, I had 50 copies of a Bo Diddley. 45 called same man 50 copies 50 copies and I was selling them for 35 or 40p each with about 30 quid now I was going to say even even back in 71 that was probably quite a bit I had 50 copies of of Linda Lou by Ray Sharp and I was selling those initially 50p a throw I had a few really rare records 
top of the thing was, was two quid a throw, you know, but generally they were 40, 50, 60 a pound. You know. And then rock, rock On Records just gradually became bigger as you well, got more it, successful. It, it, yeah, uh, uh, while I was managing Thin Lizzy, uh, it was just Friday and Saturday at, at, at um, in the flea market. And then when I decided to leave Thin Lizzy because I wanted to focus more on selling records and I wanted to start a label to re- just to reissue records like Brand New Cadillac. and Oh, not so much to record new artists, no, more to reissue. No, no intention of recording new artists, just reissue uh, stuff that majors that there was a demand for rock and roll records that that thank you rock and roll records there was demand for but that the majors weren't interested in doing anything with and the f- first one we did was brand new Cadillac and um, sea cruise and things like that link Ray but um, along the way as we were talking earlier about about the pub scene in 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 london in the early 70s when we were going to see a, there was a lot of really good bands like uh, we would have we wanted to do something with um dr feelgood but they got signed to um uh, united artists so we wanted to do something with crazy calvin and they went and did, we were going to do an album with crazy calvin and uh, it's one of the first things we we're going to do and then they went on a, on a uh, a Dutch tour and the guy who promoted the tour Bert Rockhouse and recorded an album with them there which came out on his label Rockhouse so so the first band we had were, were, were was were, were the Count Bishops and then and then we had Brand New Cadillac which was from 1958 Vince Taylor and then the next record was the one I won as Joe Strummer and it went on from there and we had quite a lot of success with like bands like Motorhead and so, was Motor, did Motorhead come to you first for a recording? Was that the first? Uh, rec- well, were you the first record label for them? We, we were the first people to put out a Motorhead so record. That, that very first Motorhead album. Yes, yeah. they 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 um they rec- actually recorded an album which was produced by Dave Edmonds for for UA, and UA didn't think it was good enough, and they so they refused to release it. And uh, I think a couple of the tracks from that ended up on Stiff. Uh, they weren't released in England, but they were on the Stiff box, set, the first Stiff box set of singles. And also they came out in France, leaving here, I think it was. But the first actual official Motorhead release was, was Motorhead uh, by Motorhead on, on, on Chiswick, and, and then the first Motorhead album, which charted. That was our first chart record, I think. Yeah, it was. So, uh, so we had over the years we had quite a fair amount of success. We had a, a, a retro rock and roll band called Rocky Sharp and the Replays, and we had a lot of hits with them. And uh, Radio Stars, they had a hit with Nervous Wreck. And were, we had a band called Sniff and the Tears, and they had a, a, a great record called Driver's Seat. I remember that. And that was top ten in America, yeah. and it was a hit all around Europe, you know. Yeah. So we had bits and pieces like that. But you know. Tell me about some of the famous people that came into your record stores. Well, because it, 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 it was the first record store, sort of collectible record store, it did attract a lot of... People, you know, journalists and 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 and, and uh, musicians and so on. Jimmy Page was one of the first named people who came in. He came in to buy some Sun 45s. That was in Goulburn. And over the years, we've had all sorts of people. Uh, some of the guys from Pink Floyd, uh, The Damned, uh, 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 American bands like The Blasters. Uh, the Cramps, Flaming Groovies, uh, Bob Dylan came in once. He was he was rehearsing the Electric Ballroom, which was literally next door to the Camden shop. And he came in. And he bought a bunch of gospel Did albums. He? Yeah. Mm. So you met you met quite a few people in the shop. I didn't meet. I wasn't there the day no, no, Bob no. Dylan came. <laughs> but it was news. I knew yeah. about it. Yeah. And is there any truth in the rumor that um, Joe Strummer? The Clash did brand new Cadillac as a result of buying the oh, yeah. song. Obviously, yes, yeah, yeah. 
Well, Joe Strummer used to, I knew him for a long time before I did before I knew he was in a band even because he used to come in. He he was he, he was uh, it was a particular blues record. I can't remember what it was that he was looking for. He used to come in every. He lived near Goldburn Road. He'd come in, and so I knew him quite well because he was a very nice guy. And uh, I can't. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. The record it was a, a New Orleans blues record, and I can never find it on a 45 for him. But uh, and then we went to see the 101ers and r r realized I knew him, and they were fantastic. So. Immediately uh, asked them to do a record, which they did. We did two, 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 four, four sides, yeah. which were released as two separate singles. But before the record came out, he left and went to the Clash. Oh, right. And the rest is history, as they yeah. say. So um, this this was Chiswick Records, which became Ace Records. It started off as Chiswick Records because uh, at that stage. By that stage, we were we knew we were going to we 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 were going to do the Count Bishops and the One O One Us and and there was another band called the Gorillas. Jesse Hector hung around the stall, so we, we we knew we were going to do some English groups. So we wanted a name that sort of reflected London, you know. And so it was Chiswick initially, and then um, a couple two two or three years down the line, we did a. A licensing deal with De with uh, EMI for the label, and uh, they weren't interested in the rock and roll stuff because we had like a mixture of you know Huey Piano Smith and the Count Bishops and the Radio Stars, the Radiators from Space, and you know all sorts of things. <laughs> Link Ray, they weren't interested in the rock and roll stuff, so. Uh, we we were making money from that, so we decided we'd take that to an independent distributor. And Trevor, one of my other partner, uh, suggested we call it Ace Records because we had a licensing deal with Ace Records in Mississippi. And so we called, I rang up Johnny Vincent in America and said, Do you mind if we call our label Ace Records? He said, No, go ahead. He, he regretted that later because we came better. better. Better known than he was. Anyway, I was it. So that's how it became Ace. And and Chiswick is still going. I mean, some people think that Chiswick uh, collapsed or went into bankruptcy or anything, but we just stopped putting out records on Chiswick around 81 or 82. But we still put out some odds and sods and do reissues and so But So Chiswick still exists. So you're still involved with the record label? No, I, I, that's why this has happened. Uh, eventually, we've been planning to, you know, because we're not getting younger. I'm 80 years of age. I'll be 81 soon. So uh, we've been planning to um, divest ourselves of the label. But it, it, it was going very well. It's got a fantastic reputation and huge catalogue. And we own a lot of masters. Over the years, we've bought thousands of masters. So we were looking for a good home for it. So in the end, we did a deal where... We did a management buyout with some of the people who worked for us, who'd been working for us for many, many years. And we sold the copyrights in the uh, masters, the recordings, and in the, um, the songs, the, the, the music copyrights, to um, uh, a Scandinavian company called Cosmos. And the, the boss of Cosmos, Frederick, is uh, it's always been a big Ace fan. He, he bought his first Ace album, which was a compilation, a rockabilly compilation called Hollywood Rock and Roll. He bought it when he was 12. So it's kind of gone to a good home. Yeah. We're very pleased about that. And so we fast forward now to the record shop. Yes. Rock, rock on record. So, so basic, so got, 50 years later, we, we've, we've got another shop with the same name. You eventually sold Ace. Uh, just before Christmas, really, and um, oh, as recently as that, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, 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 I was just driving into town one day last uh, autumn, and I saw this place for sale, and I thought, hmm, could open a record shop here. So here we are. So you, you got that enthusiasm again for opening a record store? I, had it. I do record fairs and yeah. 
wheel and deal. I have a, I have a ch chapel full of records, you know, in a village not too far from here. So how long has the store been opened? This, less than two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's certainly um, got a very, very eclectic range of music. I'm just looking at some of the um, descriptions here. US 60s, female vocals, pop, various, blues... Punk, 60s, rock and roll, jazz, northern, so on. Another one over here, weird shit, which Girl um, groups. sounds good. Girl, Girl groups. groups. Country. Yeah. Blues, rhythm and blues. Yeah. So, lots of soul. Ooh. Well, I know since we've been recording, Ted, there's been a few people in. So, uh, there have been a few people in since we've been recording. So, uh, it's, it's obviously beginning, and it's in a very, very good place, right in the middle of Stamford. Yeah, it is. Well, pe people will get to know it, you know, as I yeah. said, you're. you're we're, we're, we've, we've been open for less than two weeks. Um, there's still a lot more product to go in. I've got all these little empty spaces down here that have got to be filled. And, uh, and it, there's some 45 spaces that need to be filled. So I'm just sorting the stuff out. Vinyl seems to be making a bit of a comeback. Never went away. Did it not? No. I think a lot of the um, sort it's of young... Kind of underground. Thing, yes, you know, yes. There's, there's always been record fairs and collectors and stuff. But um, it's kind of... It's that sort of thing. The papers say, oh, vinyl's coming back. And everyone says, oh, vinyl's coming back. But it never went away, you know. But uh, it's interesting. I mean, I had a couple of schoolboys. They were probably about 15 or something in last week. And they bought some Beatles EPs and a Beatles 45 and Georgia the girl the Saturday girl here who's 16 uh, she bought uh, an album by um, Yango Reinhardt the, the French jazz guitarist for, who, from the 1940s and 50s and, and an album by The Radiators from Space which was one of the bands we had on Chiswick yes. so you know young people are still interested yeah. in vinyl it, I think Generally speaking, it's it's considered to be pretty cool among young people. Yeah. Uh, which is good because the sound is actually is better than on CDs, you know. Yeah, and also you actually get something tangible rather than just sort yeah, of having something exactly. digital well, on the, Spotify the or something. Do is look at the, the wall. Yeah. Yeah, you've got something when you buy a record. There's a huge diverse mm. diverse range here. So in your career, Ted, yeah. if we've got any listeners who fancy becoming a record you know a band manager what advice would you give them that's a hard one it's so difficult now i think because well it's it's in one way it's easier because back in the day you know unless you managed to get a record deal with a major there wasn't there weren't independent labels so you had to get a deal with a major and the majors were very picky about who they'd, they'd sign up and so on. So it was almost impossible to get a record out. And that was the only way you could get known, apart from gigging. Uh, but now there's still a gigging circuit, but I, I don't know much about it. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a place here, Mama Lizards, where a lot of young bands play. Uh, but... Um, it's it you can get your stuff up on the internet, but it's the the, the I read somewhere there's something like thirty eight million masters on Spotify that didn't get a, one play last year, so you have to you have to be imaginative and and and, and do stuff to 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 draw attention. So marketing plays it. Marketing, big, big yes, and 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 and. and it's 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 hard. It's not for the faint-hearted. It's not for the faint-hearted. I wouldn't want to be doing it now. No. You know, I mean, we've got a section here, local artists. There's only one album. It's only for people with vinyl, but um, that's a, a, somebody, a girl I know who, who's put out an album. Faye Solomon. That's right. She with a, an album called Living Rooms. Yes. And uh, any other local artists who've got vinyl will stock it, you know, yeah. but yeah. we're not doing any contemporary stuff at all. No. Leave it to. There's what? a guy in the market sells contemporary recordings. So. And what's the, what's the driving force behind the shop itself? The driving force? Me, I guess. You still Just, want it? 
yeah, I'm just interested in in it's a kind of a kind of missionary thing, you know, making people aware of great music or what you consider to be great music and uh, you know we've got a, a very wide variety I mean we were playing Segovia there that's a, not usually what we'd be playing here but I was playing some more raunchy stuff earlier so I decided to play something a bit quieter but um, you know when when we were kids at school we'd be listening to the radio and Radio Luxembourg or AFN or something you'd hear a great record by somebody, Chuck Berry or something, and go to school the next day and tell your friends about it and stuff. Mm. And we used to swap records and things like that. So it's it's the same thing, making people aware of, of music that you think they should get a chance to hear. I, I think it's great. And also there's going to be records here which won't be on Spotify or Apple. It'll be so obscure that it's not available so nobody would find it unless they come to a record shop like this yeah there's there's a you know there's like tech country there's a, a section there which is country hits which would be things you've heard of and then there's just ordinary regular country but and there's they're, they're by recently well known artists Hank Williams Marty Robbins and stuff and and and, uh, and then there's um Obscure, this is obscure stuff like Buck Rogers on Gin, which is a Louisiana label. Yeah, Herb Henson, Old Jalopy on Abbott, Joey Long, who's a great guitarist who played the Sonny Fisher records. You know, and then bluegrass here in the back. You know, so you know, where are you gonna? It's a whole different world, isn't it? Yeah, and um, I, I understand that the profits are going to charity. That's that's correct. Yeah, I don't need the money myself. I'm lucky enough to to uh, have a few pensions, and you know. So, and as you get older, you don't spend a lot of money. We go on the occasional cruise, but I, I you know, I don't need an expensive car, and I stopped doing cocaine about thirty years ago. So it's <laughs> it's it's going to charity. Yeah, and which which can we mention the names of the charities, Ted? Um, well, I, I, I've been selling memorabilia, you know, like Sex Pistols flyers and things like that. Like I, I mentioned Joe Strummer and The Clash. I, I was invited to the very first Clash gig. It was like a pre... It wasn't a public gig. It was just for some invited people, journalists and that. And uh, Mike, who works here on a Thursday, he sells stuff on eBay and... Um, He's been selling stuff on eBay for me for about 10 years, I guess. Uh, and I had an old 51 Cadillac in a barn up up the road. Uh, and I sold it last year, gave the money to charity. And um, so we took that out of the barn. And all around the sides of the barn was stuff that had been moved in there 20 or 30 years ago. Oh, right. So we started digging through there and finding all sorts of things. And one of the things Mike dug out was something that had been folded up in my pocket and was a little A4 or A5 invite for that very first Clash gig. And that went for over 4,000 quid on eBay. And Pistols Flyers, I did, like, I did some gigs with the Pistols when they started, because I knew Malcolm and... uh, uh, the Rock On Disco did a couple of gigs, one at the 100 Club and one at the Nashville Rooms. The Rock On Disco? Yeah, okay. that was me. And yeah. um, I just played Weird Shit, you know. And uh, we found some fly- some A4 flyers, and Mike's been selling those for 1,200 quid. Wow. Uh, so all that money's been going to charity. So I've been giving money to charity for, for, for like, I think last year... We raised a, a, certainly at least forty grand that oh, went fantastic. to charity, yeah. and it went to yeah. Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, East Midlands Air Ambulance, uh, Macmillan Nurses, uh, Centre Point, which is a, a very good charity for the homeless here in England, not just London but all over England. Uh, also UNICEF for, for refugees. They do very good work for refugees. So that sort of thing, you know. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So you're combining your hobby and mission 
and raising money for charity. What a great... Well, well yeah. I'm lucky to be able to do it, you yeah, know. Yeah, sure. Well, somebody said this is the best charity shop in, in uh, or Chazza, as they call it. It it's is. the best Chazza in yeah. Stamford. Well, you, Ted, you've certainly inspired me to go up into, into my loft and get my vinyl down again. You should never have been there in the first place. <laughs> um, not a wise decision putting vinyl in lofts. What's the best way to store vinyl? The best way to store vinyl is uh, somewhere where there's no extremes of temperature and certainly where there's no damp or wet. And uh, store them upright, you know, like and packed reasonably tightly yeah. so that they, they're not lying at a slant, you know, but avoid, avoid heat and, and, and wet and heat, you'll be wet okay. The cold doesn't, oh, they, the cold they, don't, they don't mind cold. No. Heat yeah. and wet, that's the two, the two things that don't work for, for, with vinyl. Ted, it's been great talking to you. Well, thank thank you. you very much for your time. And I'll put the link to the shop on the show notes so that okay. people can, if they're, if they're coming up and down, because it's, it's quite easy to get to It'll if you're up there. on the A1, isn't it? Oh, yes. We're, we're about six or seven minutes off the A1. We're five minutes from the bus station and we're seven or eight minutes from the British Rail Station. So it's easy to access, you know, and there's plenty of parking around. Uh, you can, if you're prepared to park on the outskirts of town it's free or you can park in town and pay not not too expensive a couple of quid pound or two an hour you know so it's easy to get to yeah okay and it's uh, Stamford is a fantastic shopping town you know so guys who 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 want to come I mean we get a lot of women coming in buying records here but it tends to be a male thing and uh, so there's loads of great shops for the wives to go to while they're perving in here. <laughs> Ted, it's been great talking to you. Thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm George. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I would be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best. 